talk about the Lord's Prayer. Prayer is more who it's for and what is in your heart. I encourage you to put away your phone, turn off your computer, at least turn off the monitor so that you're not distracted. This is supposed to be a time between you and God. Yes, I'm Mr. John Prudek, and I'm happy to join with you here for chapel to talk about the Lord's Prayer. Before we do, I'll pray. Dear God, thank you for your word. Thank you that we can pray to you directly. Thank you that we can share with you our concerns and that we can have faith that you hear them. Lord, I pray that As I speak today, you would give me wisdom and that you would allow those who are listening, students, the teachers, and anybody else who's listening, that you would give them ears to hear and that the wisdom from your holy word would bear fruit. Amen. So I'm going to talk to you guys today about the Lord's Prayer. And the Lord's Prayer comes from Matthew 6, 5 through 14. So feel free to follow along. This is in the first book of the Gospels and the New Testament. Verse 5 from the sixth chapter. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, Close the door and pray to your Father, who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Now, you are all probably familiar with this prayer. We've prayed it before in chapel. And the fact that at the end, you didn't hear the doxology, the for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, that might have sounded a little bit different to you. So I'll explain why later. But let's talk about how Jesus recommends that we pray. So the first thing he says is that don't be like hypocrites who love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Now, this doesn't mean that we shouldn't pray in public. Jesus himself quite often prayed in public. What Jesus is saying here is that prayer is more about who it's for and what is in your heart as opposed to being seen by others. So to illustrate, pardon me, to illustrate this, think about it like YouTube likes. You're not praying for other people's praise. Don't pray to try and sound cool or especially holy. You're only praying for God. So Jesus says, don't be like the hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. A little bit of historical context for this. When Jesus was sharing this message with his disciples, it was custom for Jewish people to pray together at certain times of the day. So some people at those times would pray discreetly in a way that they would only be seen by God, but others They would do it loudly on the street corner so that people would see, oh, look how holy that person is, in the hopes that they would get lots of 
views, and likes. Instead, you should only be praying for God's approval. Go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father, who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. So prayer is just between you and God. If you do happen to pray in a public place, as I just did and will do again many times, as your teachers do, as your pastors do, that's fine. But you shouldn't be praying in the hopes of impressing other people. Your goal is to just pray between you and God. Also, this recommendation that Jesus has to close the door and pray to your Father who is unseen I think it has some application for us in the 21st century. This is also a way to help make sure that we're not distracted when we pray. So if and when you decide to have some time between yourself and God, I encourage you to put away your phone, turn off your computer, at least turn off the monitor so that you're not distracted. This is supposed to be a time between you and God, not between you and God and everybody else. So that's who prayer is for. It's for God's approval, and it's not for other people's approval. Now, Jesus also says, don't be like the pagans who heap up empty phrases. Now, what Jesus is talking about here is something that might be categorized as quality over quantity. These are good words to know. Quality is asking how good is something, whereas quantity is asking how much is something. So Jesus is saying, instead of having lots of pointless words in your prayers, you should have a few well-chosen, meaningful words. So to illustrate this, this is what I think of when I think of quality. I like tacos. For those of you who've had tacos, you probably do too. These tacos look fresh. The meat looks well marinated. It looks really tasty. I'm starting to get a little hungry myself. I'm sure many of you are as well. I would much rather eat this than this. I don't know if you guys see what is in the cubicles, but those are called Twinkies. Now, maybe one or two Twinkies is okay, but when your prayers are mindless and repetitive and you're not putting a whole lot of thought into them, It's kind of like a cubicle full of Twinkies, as opposed to a nice, (laughs) well-seasoned taco. So I'm sure God feels the same way. When you offer up just empty phrases, when you pray without thinking about it, it doesn't mean very much to you, and God probably doesn't appreciate it either. Whereas if you think about what you're praying, if you're honest with God, that is like, well a well-seasoned taco. So Jesus says, pray in quiet between yourself and God and pray in a way that reflects quality rather than quantity. What Jesus is referring to here is pagans. Pagans are uh, people who do not believe in God or in fact believe in too many gods. They believe in dozens or hundreds of gods rather than one god. And they would pray just saying the name of their gods over and over and over again, thinking that the quantity would compensate for the quality. So don't pray like pagans. So when we look again at the Lord's Prayer, I want you to notice some things. So one of the things that stands out to me is it's quite short. He says, this is then how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. It's quite short. I think that took me less than a minute. So that tells us that prayers do not need to be long. They can be long. But again, like I said, it's a matter of quality over quantity. So if you're in a difficult situation, you shouldn't think, I don't have enough time to give a nice long prayer. No, prayers can be short. Another thing I want you to notice is 
that this prayer can be broken up into two categories. So the first category is about God. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. So that's the first category. The first category is about God. And this, in a way, kind of parallels the Ten Commandments. I don't know if you guys remember, I did a chapel message last semester on the Ten Commandments and explained that the Ten Commandments can be broken up into two categories, love God and love your neighbor. Well, the Lord's Prayer can kind of be broken up into two categories like the Ten Commandments, God and your neighbor. So here we have the first request. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now, hallowed is a word you probably don't hear very often or use very often. It means to make holy. So we're praying to our Father in heaven that his name would be made would be made holy. His name is holy, but we're asking that people would treat his name with holy reverence. Also, notice that it's our Father in heaven. It's not our God in heaven. Our Father is our God in heaven, but it's interesting that Jesus says our Father. God was and is Jesus' Father, but he's also our Father. And so that implies that there is a personal relationship between us and our Father God, which is pretty significant. There's a big difference between talking to your father and talking to someone whom you've never met, much less a very powerful, eternal, omniscient, omnipotent being whom you've never met. So this implies that there should be a connection between you and God, and that God's name should be made holy. Now this picture here, this is, obviously you can see a lion and a lamb. This is an image of what heaven might be like, where people will put aside their fears and their violence and their lies and their deceit and all the other ways that they hurt their neighbors. So this second and third petition or request is that God's kingdom will come and that God's, king, God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So that is the first half of the Lord's Prayer about God and making God's kingdom in heaven take place on earth. Now the second half of the Lord's Prayer is about us and the community. So the first petition or request is, give us today our daily bread. Here I've got a picture of kimchi jjigae. It's one of my favorite Korean dishes. Notice that this is about us. This is a communal request. It's not, give me today my daily bread. It's give us today our daily bread. So when you pray, you should be thinking about not just yourself, but others. How are other people suffering? How are other people needing God's help and God's love. So that's why it's important to notice that it's about give us today our daily bread. Also notice that it's not our yearly bread or our lifetime bread, it's our daily bread. That we should pray that, what do I need today? Lord, today I need energy. Lord, today I have a test. I'd like to be able to remember what I need for this test. Lord, today I'm going to my grandparents' house. I like spending time with my grandparents, so I pray that that would be a joyful occasion. Don't worry about next week or next month or next year. Just worry about today. Now, this one is unfortunately quite personal for me. You can see here there's an angry man who's not being a very good driver. He's, he doesn't have both hands on the wheel and he looks quite upset. So I'm guessing that somebody cut him off. So Jesus here says, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now, what we should remember is everybody makes mistakes, everybody sins, and that nobody is perfect. So I'm sure all of you have sometimes been in the car where either your mom or your dad honks at somebody else or somebody else honked at your mom and dad. And 
I'll admit, I have not always been a perfect driver, and sometimes my expectations for other drivers are also a little bit too high. And although I've never, I don't have a hammer in my car, and I don't pull it out when I get angry, sometimes I do think about doing something like that. So God says, or Jesus says, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. When we get upset at other people, we should remember that we've also made mistakes, we've also sinned, and God has generously forgiven us our many, many debts. So when somebody else wrongs us, sins against us, we should remember that God has forgiven us, and therefore we should forgive other people. And that leads us to the last petition, which is, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So this may remind you of Psalm 23, where in Psalm 23, David, the author of Psalm 23, says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside quiet pastures. I'm trying to remember it right now. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. So, leading us not into temptation is similar to us walking into the valley of the shadow of death. So, when we do face challenges, when we do face temptations, we should remember that God is the one who can deliver us from the evil one, from temptation. It's not something that we can do on our own. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we're familiar with ending the Lord's Prayer with these words. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This is what's called a doxology. It's a way to praise God, and it's a natural way of ending the prayer. This is a fitting way to end the prayer. You might think it sounds a little bit grim to end the prayer by saying, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Amen. It's kind of scary. So... After the Lord's Prayer was given by Jesus, after Jesus' ministry on earth was done and the Bible was being put together, some scribes felt that it would be a natural way to end the prayer with a doxology because many prayers are, and many letters written by Paul and John and Peter also end with these kinds of doxologies. So there's nothing wrong with ending the Lord's Prayer in this way. If when you pray, you wanted to end your prayer with, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever, it would be a good reminder that these are things that we should pray for, that we should pray for God's glory and God's kingdom to come to earth. And then verse 14, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. So that's the Lord's Prayer. Before we wrap up, let's pray it together one last time together. So I'll go back to where it's all together. Here we go. So, Hamke, she, Jack, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And we can do the doxology. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now I'll pray for all of us. Dear God, thank you for your holiness. Thank you for your son who came to this earth to save us and redeem us from our sin. Lord, thank you for giving us this simple, direct, and understandable guide for how we should pray. Lord, I pray that by remembering how you recommended that we pray, we would want to pray more often as a way of loving you better and loving our neighbors better. Amen. <laughs>